My wife, in case you didn't know. <laughs> You're still older than me. Five months. <laughs> All right, children. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh. All right. Good morning. Good. Morning. good. I, I'm going to give it up because it, you know what I heard. Everybody says to me, "You talk too much." <laughs> so. Today, I'm going to have self-control and say, I'm going to have my husband lead. I will, I'll jump in. Don't believe me. I don't think I can help it, you know, and you'll see it. But for now, I'm going to give it to him and get it started. Thank you. And, and there's a reason she talks. I was explaining this to some people the other day. There was a study on how many words people use in a typical day. You know, the, the average man speaks about 3,000 words a day. The average woman speaks three to four times that many in a day. And so when we're quiet in the evening, it's because we've used up our allotment of words for the day. So, yeah. So, Father, we just, we just want to come before you this morning. We lift up your name. We praise you for you are great and mighty. You have given us everything that we have, Father, and we thank you so much for that. We just ask you now to bless this time to open our hearts to receive what you would give us, Father, that we could take it to, and, and live the word that you would have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So when we were setting up the schedule, who was going to speak when and what were they going to speak on while Justin and Jessica are gone? Uh, we took this week, and then we were talking about what would our theme be, and it would be, you know, how God remains faithful, and so we decided we would do seasons of life, and how God remains faithful in those seasons, and so then we sat down and we started at separate tables, figuring out what we were going to say, and when we came back together, we were nowhere close. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking seasons of life in, in very macro ways, right? I'm thinking, uh, uh, you know, consider you've got youth and then adolescence is a season of life and young adult is a season of life and adulthood is a season of life, golden years is a season of life. There's other seasons of life like I'm growing up, I'm getting married, I'm having a family, uh, other thing, family events, right? Those are seasons of life. Yeah, that's not where she was. <laughs> and then we find that there's, there's a really good website. I encourage it because it's, it's, it's not uh, uh, some church's doctrinal website or, or some specific pastor's ideas. It's actually a, a website that consists of a bunch of Christian bloggers, all right? And they write some really good stuff. It's called iBelieve.com. And so... So our message today is inspired by that. I mean, that's, that's the, the, where we get the structure for today's message on the seasons of life, right? And so, you want something? Oh, all right. So when you look at that, it talks about spiritual seasons in our life. So there's, there's six of them we're going to talk about today. If you want to take notes, we're starting on number one. And the first season, what's that? Yeah, God remains faithful, yes. In the seasons of life. There we go. If you want to play. Yes. So the first one we're going to talk about is the dry season. If you want to know what a dry season is, it's when it seems like God is not speaking. He's far away. You don't recognize him. You can't sense his presence. You don't hear his voice. You wonder if he's even near enough to hear you let alone you hear him. Lots of examples of that in Scripture. The first one that came to my mind when I thought of it was Job, right? Especially if you look at Job 7 and Job 8, where, which is, or Job 9, where he's, he's praying. To first, Job 7 is where he's saying, ruining the day he was born. And Job 9 is where he's saying, God, where are you in all of this? Of course, his friends and his wife are telling him to curse God and die. I mean, he won't do that, right? But he's asking, where are you, God? Where are you in all these struggles that I'm going 
right? David, if you read Psalm 22, David is, is saying, where are you? I'm surrounded by everybody and all these troubles, and I don't sense you in my life here. Uh, and even Jesus at one point when he was on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you in all of this, God? Right? Trust me, he's there. He's still there. Jeremiah 29 uh, verses 12 and 14 it says, you, God says, you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. That's a promise from God. I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your hearts. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. That's, that's a promise from God. He will be found. You will find him when you seek him with all your heart. Right? Uh, Isaiah chapter 55, 10 says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not, do not return to it without watering the earth and making it blood and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Did you have something you wanted to say on that? Because no, no, go ahead. Keep, keep going. You sure? Yeah. Just just grab it from me when you're ready. <laughs> By the way, we only have seven pages. They tell us that it's about ten minutes a page. I hope every. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, poor nursery workers. <laughs> so. As, as we talk about these six seasons, we wanted to describe it. We wanted to give some scripture background on what God says about it. And then we wanted to give you some, some ideas and some steps on how to work through those seasons, right? And we may experience this type of season after going through difficult times. We, we've checked out. We're half-hearted. Uh, just stuck in a rut, right? So first thing you need to do is, is recognize the situation. Recognize, oh my God, no, that's it. I, I don't recognize God. I don't see God in my life. Where is it? So you have to recognize it. And understand that this season, like most of the rest we're going to discuss, they don't last. They eventually dry up and go away. That season changes. So just know that. So that and I say that as an encouragement because... That's when you want to press in. When you know that this season is not going to last, that's your encouragement to press in. Just keep pressing in tighter and, and harder, all right? Know that he is near. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. That's what, that's what Hebrews tells us, right? He never leaves us nor forsakes us. And then one of the things that, you know, you can read the Bible daily, but I also say pray the Bible. When you don't know what to pray, you don't know how to pray, open the Bible and start reading it as a prayer to God. Especially virtually any one of the Psalms. They work really well. That's what they were written as. Right? But any, any section of the Bible that you find inspiring, just read it as a prayer to God. That's a wonderful way to get through that kind of thing, is, is just to pray the Bible. Right? All right. So I'm sure some of you experienced dry seasons. I know for sure I have, right? And the next one. So, yeah. Um, one other thing that um, that I was thinking about is when it comes to dry seasons, it is hard to be in the seasons, no matter, you know, except the, obviously the happy seasons and things like that. But waiting and, and having that, you know, uh, you feeling like, set apart or not feeling his presence continuously in your life, you know? That's not what his intention is, obviously. You know, God's desire is for us to be really connected to him and have that life flowing from him to us continuously so that we can thrive, right? His desire for us is to thrive in him and thrive in him for ourselves so that also we can, you know, bring that hope and life to the people around us, right? So that's one of the reasons, I mean, really... The, there is nothing but going to Him and getting that life, you know, from Him is the way to live, right? And that's what really we are, we are um, trying to bring, you know, or trying to live and exemplify here in our church. So, um, so 
Yeah, Rob talked about several scriptures, you know. Again, he talked about how uh, we experience these seasons sometimes when we are maybe even living in sin. You may feel that dry season. If you were to really recognize that, obviously, what do you do? Go to the Lord and repent. And he is faithful, right? To say, okay, come on, take it, whatever you need, you know? That's all I'm looking for, for you to recognize it and come to me, right? And he's faithful to do so. So that's what it is. You know, for me, from even teaching this, um, uh, preparing for this, I can only say to myself, Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for, faith, for your faithfulness, no matter what I go through in my life. I know I can count on you. Sometimes there are times that we cannot even talk to your own husband, you know, your own spouse. There are times that because you don't know how to explain, not that I want to keep it from him or anything like that, but the gut-wrenching situations that you go sometimes, you cannot explain to your spouse, you know, as much as you want to. But you know what you could do? You can go to the Lord, right? And that's what all the Psalms are all about. I love, love, love. Whenever I'm having a really hard time, I look through the Psalms. I'm flipping through the Psalms and say, I know I can find a Psalm for everything I'm going through. And I stuck there for a while and say, Lord, when David got this, and he got the relief no matter what he went through, and so therefore, I can get it, right? And I don't want to leave you until I get it. And that's what I go after, you know? And my, my time, I know I think I'm going to be off script already. I can tell it. So when, I, when I'm not, when I, when, I am, when I am, you know, my, my best time is like 4 o'clock in the morning, you know? 4, 4.30 in the morning when I get up, especially if something bothering me. You know, this past year that I really went through quite a bit in a sense that when you're changing a culture in an organization, there is so much weight on your head and you feel it. You know, when you're trying to lead 65 to 70 people, you know, that looking for you, it, you feel that weight every single day of your life. And you know what? I can say to myself, Lord, I want to go into that, in, the, in that building, into that, you know, place with joy because I can do that because of you, Lord, walking with me into those doors, you know? So, but my strength have to come from him. Nobody else. I cannot do it. So 4.30 in the morning or between 4.30 and 5, I would say, you know, again, I'm looking for the scriptures, depend on what I was going through it until I find something and I would pray that. And that's what he meant by, I said to him, when he put the, in the notes, pray the Bible. I said, honey, what do you mean by that? You know, explain to me, you know? So he goes, you know, Oh, you're looking through the Bible. Oh, I got it. You know, I just want to make sure we're on the same page, you know. So that's what it is. You know, find those Psalms. You know what David felt. You know, his heart-wrenching situation that he went through. Where he was, you know, running, running and not able to, you know, feel his presence. But yet, pour his heart out completely to the Lord and get what he wanted. And obviously, we saw the result of it, right? He became one of the... One of the favorite kings, second most important king that Israelites had. So what he accomplished. So we can have that. We can have that if we want to it and we go after it, right? All right, on to the next season, right? The first season was the dry season. Second season is waiting season. I want to give you a personal experience about the waiting season. It was 2004. And you know, before that, my husband decided he's going to give up his job and try to start his own job, right? Consulting job. So he did, 99, but up, up until 2004, right? Whenever he started, but up until 2004. I have to tell you, even yesterday, he got his social security stuff, paperwork. I said, honey, let me see what it's look like. <laughs> so we're nowhere near to retire for number one. That's okay. You know, I figured I'm going to work through whenever. And, but, uh, but I was thinking about it and looking through all those years when I first came here and several years, you know, there was nothing. I felt like, God, we did not really make anything. <laughs> How did we make through, you know? But we did. We made through. Because again, you know, it's Bible talks about his faithfulness reaches to generation, you know? And I, I, I thought about my parents and my grandparents, you know, what they poured into the Lord. And I say, you know what? I can claim that. That's my inheritance. I can claim that, Lord, you know. And they told us and taught us how to serve him with everything we got, no matter what we have, you know, whatever it is. And I, you know, and I, and I sense that even as I was looking at that, yep, we can't retire, but I'm sure glad that we went through. God brought us through that. And he was there with us. 
He was there with us in those times when we were making very, very little. So I'm thankful for that. But waiting season. So during that period, you know, we have two little kids. And, you know, Rob with, the, with his business. I know I'm off the track, but that's okay. Um, and, uh, and we didn't even have, actually, uh, insurance, health insurance for the kids. And for one thing, I was just so wor worried about it in a sense that, you know, that's, that's something, especially, I could care less. I hardly ever go to the doctor. I don't know when was the last time I, was, I'm with the, I went to the doctor, even now. And I had to remind myself once in a while, I better go, you know, kind of thing. But for my kids, on the other hand, totally different story. I wanted that for them, in case, in case, in case. But they have been so blessed with good health, so I'm thank the Lord. We never really needed it, you know? But yet, I wanted that. So as we were going through, finally, I decided, okay, I'm going to, you know, go into teaching. And, and finished getting my certification from here, from the States, and uh, applied for the jobs. You know, applied, applied. I went to the actually teaching, uh, teacher recruitment day or whatever they call it. Once a year, that happens. And you know what? Right there on the spot, I have several people. You know, in fact, they would usually um, interview you and then will call you for a second interview wherever into the situations. But I had people from Virginia, Delaware, North Carolina, gave me a job right on the spot. They called their superintendent and offered me a job. In fact, they paid me to go actually meet them, you know. So I actually accepted a job with Mecklenburg School District in North Carolina at an IBM uh, school to teach biology and AP biology. You know, that's what they charged me with. I said, sure, signed up. Because what I wanted to do was uh, get a job so that my kids can have health insurance and, and stability, something like that. And, and, and then, but I, of course, pulling up everything from here and going there wasn't necessarily easy. Then I'm thinking about all the things in my family, my church family that I have, my family that I have here. And I'm like, what am I going to go do? You know, I already left home. I don't want to leave this, Lord, you know. So that was a hard thing. But I was ready to do it if I absolutely have to kind of thing. So I accepted the position, but yet still felt that God's going to come through with a job here. You know, so I kept praying and praying. During that time, I don't know whether you guys remember, 2003, 2004, Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. I don't know whether you guys remember that, but we did that study, 40 days. You know, I don't know whether we did that through the church or whatever. We did. So I had that book in my hand. Every single day, walking around, I would be praying that, that JBS prayer. Oh, Lord, expand my territory. You know, bless me. You know, I need your blessing right now. Expand my territory. You know, enlarge my, you know, whatever. So I would pray that, pray that, pray that. And then all of a sudden, Williamsville School District called, and you Newfane, Newfane called, you know, and started interviewing me. Newfane offered me a position before Williamsville offered. So I took the position with Newfane right in the nick of the time, just before the school started. I was, you know, we were thinking about, we actually went, you know, and met with the people in North Carolina, met with the people in Virginia, met with the people in Delaware, and yet God came through, you know. That was a waiting season that I said, well, Lord, you know, I want you to bless me. I want to bless my family. I know you're faithful. You can do it. You know, he's the God of impossible, isn't he? And he is. And, and that's what he taught me over the years. Over the years, he taught me I can count on his faithfulness. So he did that. You know, got a job, 2004, and sent him to school with that. <laughs> you know, so God, God has a way. You know, sometimes we don't know. We don't know what's happening. Trust him anyways, even when we don't understand him. That's what it is. Today we actually sing, trust him, even though when we don't understand him. Trust him without even knowing the borders, you know. That's another song. So that's the thing that God can, um, God can do for us, okay. Waiting season, yes. You know, you may be waiting for different things. I guess I, guess I need to move. Hannah, I was reading about Hannah, you know. You know, God was listening when Hannah was poured out her heart you know, in the temple, right? And knowing that he, she went through what she went through, you know, yep, she was a, married to a great guy, but yet, and yet, you know, having other person in her life or in his life have the child, but she didn't. And that was a gut-wrenching thing for her. She wanted the ba her own child so badly, she would go and cry out to the Lord. God listened. And you know, you know the rest of the story, right? That she was blessed with Samuel, who was a great prophet, became a great prophet. So that's the kind of thing God can do, right? In waiting season. So it's taking about Psalm 5, 3. 
David talks about this. It says, in the morning, Lord, I come to you with my request and wait patiently, knowing that you will come through, right? And that's what it is. All right, so several examples, Moses, David, you know, we can go on and on and on. I have a bunch of things, but I'm going to, waiting is tough, but take heart, right? Waiting is tough, be heart and take heart and wait for the Lord and see the goodness of the Lord, right? And that's what it is. You can't do that. God, you know, also too, when, when God wants us to, I guess, wait, even though waiting is hard, but God, God wants us to wait with expectancy and God wants us to wait because he wants us to do the waiting in a good way. Yes. You know, yes. that's what it is. He wants us to wait in a, in a good way, not to say, oh, this and oh, that. But we can have, you know, we can have, we can experience his goodness. In fact, that could be just him getting close to us, right? And that would be so amazing. You know, what else do you need sometimes? When you're in the presence of the Lord, like today, I'm thinking, oh my God, I can be just here forever. You know, the sweet presence of the Lord that you feel. And you know, you think everything will just drop off of you, isn't it? When you are completely in His presence. But anyways, those, that's another thing. But God's wants me to learn how to wait so that I can wait well, right? And that's one of the things that uh, what, what I was just talking about. Um, and stop doubting. When you're waiting, stop doubting. And because we know God has plans, plans to bless us, plans to prosper us, right? And so that's one thing, you know, don't wait, don't doubt when you're waiting. And because though he who promised will deliver, right? So that's one thing. And wait with expectation. Psalm 37, 7 says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. And then Psalm 41, 40, chapter 1, uh, verse 1 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. Right? Don't you love it? Psalms is something that's glorious. I don't know how he wrote it, but I'm telling you, there, the, every psalm it has something glorious, right? And I love it, love it, love it. So anyways, pers in personal, I just talked to you guys about that. And I said, as we wait with expectancy, we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You know, that's another scripture in Psalm 27. So wait, but wait well without grumbling, you know, knowing that, wait with expectation, knowing that he will come through. He's faithful. You know, we can count on that. All right. That's waiting season. I don't know if you're waiting now. Say, it's okay. I know it's tough because I've been there. I was talking to my sister for a number of years. She was waiting and waiting and waiting. She's an engineer. You know, my youngest sister. And she's been here for almost over 10 years in the States. And she decided to stay home with her two, ch two children, two girls, until they go went to school without working. You know, she, obviously she went to school and came out beautifully through the college, you know. Um, lots of, she set record for physics doing, you know, outperformed in the history of that university. She outperformed every person that went through the university. She set a record for physics, you know, engineering. And then she's sitting at home. Sometimes it was hard for her. I would say to her, get to know the Lord during this time. Get to know the Lord during this time. Spend time, you know, with the Lord. You know what? All of a sudden, all both kids are in the, in the, the timing, you know. He makes everything perfect in his time. That's what it talks about, you know. It was a perfect timing for her to get a job about a month ago, you know, and a perfect place where they openly invited her into their team of engineers, 12, 13 engineers, you know, mostly white Americans. You know, she never been worked here before. She went in and did the, her interview, you know, and the, that's the first job that she applied for and went for an interview, and they loved her so much right away, offered her a position the second time they talked to her, and then they said, you know, they didn't even want her to go home without t them taking her to a, a lunch. All 12 engineers or 13 engineers left that day after they offered her a job. Let's go have a lunch. You know, that's how much they loved her. And she became a part of this group of 12, 13 engineers. My younger sister, you know, I, I reminded her, remember? 
God makes everything beautiful in his timing. This is the perfect timing. So that's the kind of thing that God does, you know? So think about that. All right, that's waiting. Hopefully you got some... <laughs> Oh, oh, hopefully you got some pointers on that. All right, moving on. Okay. I wasn't going to move on yet. I just wanted to make one last comment on waiting. <laughs> yeah, I do. I'm very good at it. I, and, and if you wonder why I'm standing over there, it's to stop the... I was the windscreen for the microphone. So one of, one of the comments I've, I had read on waiting, uh, the lady Betsy Childs Howard wrote, you know, God wants me to learn how to wait so that I can wait well. God wants something even better for me. Rather than end my waiting, he wants to bless my waiting. So I, you know, I thought, well, that's, so that, that's one of those lady bloggers on that website. Really good, yeah. He wants to bless my waiting. Wants me to learn how to wait well, or not learn, but he just wants me to wait well. So, the next season... At 10 minutes a page, we're through two pages. Season, waiting season, and now we have the grinding season. And so if you're grinding, that's busy, 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 busy. 24 hours in a day is just not enough. Probably 30 isn't. Right? You don't even have time to, to, to rest even. And that's, that's really when the enemy tries to take advantage of you. He knows you're so distracted with so many things, you know, uh, so we've got some scriptures to go along with that, and, and a lot of them just are with giving thanks that God's brought you through this day, right? This is the day the Lord has done. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, right? Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. You know, may the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So... And in Matthew chapter 11, we read, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So, there's some scripture there. So, there's a lot of things. We, we all have really busy lives. I have really busy life at work. She has a really busy life. I thought mine was busy, then I saw her life. No, I, she's a really busy. But some of the things we do, you know, we do certain things to, to help w uh, organize ourselves so that, so that we're not so busy. One of the things I read from Oswald Chambers years ago is called false obedience. And, and really what that means is recognizing what your responsibilities are, what you're supposed to be doing, and not doing somebody else's. That's false obedience. If you do, you see a job that needs to be done and, it, and it's not your job, but you do it anyhow, that's false obedience. Unless you know you should be taking care of it and you take care of it, that's false obedience. So make sure you recognize what your responsibilities are. If you're so busy, make sure you recognize what it is you're really responsible for. Uh, one of the things I do at work every day when I come in, the first thing I do is I just make a list of the tasks I have to get done that day. I don't put any detail in it. I don't put them in any order. I just keep, oh, I gotta take care of this, and I write them down. Don't think them in your head, because if you think them in your head, A, you're gonna miss them, or you're gonna stop listing them, and you're just gonna think on, oh, this task, oh, I gotta call this person, and then we've gotta discuss this, and, then, and you're gonna forget to do the rest of your list. Write them down, just list them, not in any order, without any detail. I have to arrange this. I have to, to call this person. I have to respond to this customer. Things like, then go back, once you've got them all listed, then you go back in and add just a few notes and maybe you can prioritize them then. One of the first things I do when I get in the morning, I look at, I look at yesterday's list and see what I didn't get done. Of course, that goes on my list. I think, what else came in? What emails did I get in that I didn't respond to? Because I'm in customer service, customer support. So most of my stuff is dealing with customers who have problems. So I'm looking through my emails and trying to find, oh, I gotta respond to these people here. So, and then you put, add a little, so it just helps organize that busy, busy, busy. And when you make that all, then you say, oh, wait a minute, maybe I do have time all day to get these done. Or maybe these things can get put off to later. When you do that, it lets you recognize that you're not as swamped as you think you are. You really are swamped, but not as bad as what you think it is. 
Uh, and one of the other things my boss, my last boss told us this all the time, have the courage to say no. It's much easier to say yes than it is to say no. Say, when somebody asks you to do something and you think, oh man, I really don't want to turn them down, but I don't know how I'm going to get this done or when I'm going to fit it into my schedule, have the courage to say no. Just with a simple explanation. You know, I just, I don't have the resources, I don't have the time, I've got so much going on right now, I just can't take that responsibility right now. So have the courage to say no. And then rely on the Lord for strength. Really, that's, that's where everything comes from. You've got a spouse maybe, or other family members, and you can rely on them for strength. Oh, yeah. But really, the strength comes from the Lord, yeah. right? Did you have more you wanted to say on being busy? I know you're busy. Do you have time? Yes. Yes. <laughs> no, but uh, really, though, it, it is. Like some of us, you know, a lot of, and the culture, you know, becoming that way. We're becoming more busy and busy and busy. Something about, you know, the, in the culture that we're living in, too. So taking that time to recognize you know, what am I doing? Even, in fact, I was just, I was talking to Jessica the other day after the elders meeting, and I said to her, you know what? I just really need to reflect what I'm doing. What is my priority? What should I not do, you know? To the point where I actually only signed up for one credit hour course and stuff. Usually three, three to six credit hours I sign up along with my full-time job. I decided, you know what? I, I did an independent study over the summer. You know, and I, I thought to myself, I didn't have any summer this summer. You know, I'm still working and actually doing a double duty. Um, and then on top of that, finished my independent study, three, three credit hour course. And I just felt like, oh, you know, I'm just so under pressure. I'm not even feeling like time to serve the Lord in the way that I want to. So I felt like I need to push, pull back in some of the things that I'm doing. So I, I talked to my advisor and talked to my you know, administrator assistant at the at UB, and I said, you know what? Is there any way that I could just not take a course? If I absolutely had to take a course, what do I need to do? So my advisor gave me, uh, you know, advised me, hey, you can do, you know, you can continue your independent study into the fall by just signing up for one credit hour course so that I don't lose my, you know, tracking of where I'm at with my, my coursework. So I thought, wow, thank you, Lord. You know, sometimes that's another thing, you know, reflecting on, where you're at, what do you need to do? Not that I am perfect, not at all, because sometimes I think I feel like I take on a lot more than I need to, but, but some, you know, saying no to your own thing. Sometimes we bring things on ourselves, not somebody else putting it, but really we take on too much, you know, and then feeling overwhelmed with that. So be uh, wise about that, you know, on how much you're going to take on that. So, and make sure that you have, and if you can't, Get rid of anything. Well, you know where to go, you know. Early in the morning at 4.30, get up and spend time with the Lord. Oh, Lord, you are good. Your goodness in my life, you know, is wonderful. And your strength made perfect in my weakness, you know. You can get me through and take a deep breath. And, you know, and I do that, by the way. That's another practical thing. When you're so overwhelmed with certain things in that grinding season, just taking, you know, time to deep breathe really helps you. It's good for your body, I learned, you know. There is this thing called mindfulness, you know. And not that I will go into all those kind of things, but there are certain principles that are good. As I'm driving, I literally think about taking a deep breath from my, from my soul to my head, you know. Long, deep breath and releasing it several times. In, it, it worked for me. Anything that anxious that I am, you know, I can't wait to get to work to get certain things done. Especially those emails comes and, and you're like, you want to take care of it right away. You know, I'm, I'm like that. Certain emails, I want to respond and take care of them right away. Or certain things that come to you from the state or from the city, you know, whatever. From the central office and you need to respond to them right away. And sometimes you feel this little, you know, um, frustrated or want to get that done. And I can't wait to get to classroom and do it but, or the school and do it. But in the process, though, I'm working, you know, the process is really important sometimes, going through that, thinking through and taking deep breaths. When I do that, I could actually think clearly and I can prioritize in my head what I'm going to 
tackle as soon as I walk into the building. You know, so things like that. You can do some practical uh, things as well. So here it is. It's talking about 2 Corinthians 12, 9. We are still in grinding season. It says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. And that's what we need when we are in that grinding season, right? Yes, yes you can say, Lord, you're so good. And there is no, you know, lack in him, right? When we need that, when we still need to go through that grinding season, you could still tap into him and get that, you know, uh, what you need. And, you know, well, you know, I'm going to tell you something. I don't consider myself necessarily a very smart person because I know I come across a lot of brilliant people in my life and I appreciate their brain power, you know. I appreciate the way they teach and things like that. But, you know, lately I've been, there are times where I actually pray, God, expand my brain cells. I actually ask them, ask the Lord that, you know. I need more power. I need to, you know, I need you to expand my brain power. I literally ask the Lord, you know, about that. So, why not, right? Why not? So that's what I did. But anyway, so that's the grinding season. All right. All right. We, we've been through three seasons now. Typically, I think we got four, but no, we got six. So we've been through the dry season, the waiting season, and the grinding season. And we have test and trial season. Do I really need to describe that? I didn't think so. Know, too, that this will end. This will not last, but you will. All right? Amen. You know, and one of the worst things in, in trials and, and, and test season is you don't even know what trial you're in. You know, that's, that, you don't know what you're facing. You don't even, you're like, God, what, what is going on here? Why am I under attack here? You don't even know what trial you're in. So, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Let joy be your continual fest. Make your life a prayer. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for your life. And in Jeremiah 29.11 we read, For I know the plans I have for you. So when you think you're tra facing trials and tests, know that God says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You know, and then Luke 10 says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to co overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. So as you think about tests and trials and you need that strength, right? So, so there's some things I was reading. If you need strength, let him strengthen you. If you need comfort, let him comfort you. If you need courage, let him encourage you. Remember Peter walking on the water, right? That was a trial. He started sinking. He's out in the middle of the sea and he starts sinking. Why? Because he took his eyes off the Lord for just a second. You know, when he was in the boat and he sees Jesus walking out there and he says, Jesus, is that you? If it is, bid me come. And Jesus says, Peter, come. He gets out of the boat and he starts walking right towards Jesus. And the minute he turned to look at all the water around him and he realized, oh, this is not. He took his eyes off. The minute he took his eyes off Jesus, he started sinking. And then Jesus reached out his hand and lifted him right up again, right? That's what, that's what our trials are. We can keep our eyes on Jesus. He will lift us up. Did you have something you wanted to say there? I'm sure. I'm, I'm what just. A silly question. I'm just going to read this. Um, James one five. Talk about James, you know, James, the brother of Jesus, right? I think he was the younger brother. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, younger brother. So this is what he. I think he probably know a little bit, even though he wasn't a really a big. Uh, in a big, big time in the picture, but I'm sure he knows a little bit about what he went through with Jesus, his brother, right? Older brother. So this is what he says in James 1.5, okay? Consider it a pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, 
because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any one of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all who without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But you, when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded. So the point here is, yep, that's expected. Have the trials and tribulations and all that kind of stuff, right? Living, in the, living, is, living as humans on this earth. But we don't have to be, you know, alone. Because he did, did say he never leave us nor forsake us, right? And ask what we need that he will give us. So that's basically what he's saying. So, um, so you know, go to him. That's what we need to do whenever we need something from him, you know. Again, lacking wisdom. Ask, you know, today I pray for somebody for wisdom, right? Actually, a couple people this morning. So ask for the wisdom. So consider it's a pure joy. I don't know, maybe when we go through trials, can we say that? Can we say that, that, oh, it's a joy to go through, <laughs> right? It's like almost like, how could I? But that's what it says. Bible says that, right? Um, all right, so that's that. So, so dry season, waiting season, grinding season, and then trials and tests and trials. And the last one, spirit, oh, oh, number five, the spiritual warfare season, okay? I, I have to tell you, I don't know. I'm thinking... As I was looking at this, I said, well, when was I had to do this spiritual warfare? Maybe I didn't recognize. Maybe I went through those thing times. Maybe I didn't recognize it. I cannot pinpoint something, you know? I just need to do some soul searching, I think, about this. I bet you I went through, but I can't really give you an example. I'm sure I've done that, right? So. So how, you know, if you think about spiritual warfare and you think, oh, I don't know when I've been through that. How many of you have repented? I'm not, don't raise your hands, please. You've repented of a sin lifestyle or something in your life that you've been consistently doing or something that you've done time and time again, and you repent of it, and later you find yourself right back in that same trap again, doing the exact same thing again. That's spiritual warfare, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, that's really what that is. That, Satan knows it. That's a weak spot in you, and yeah, you can repent of it, but I can just go right back at it again. A lot of times we think it's flesh and blood. It's a, it's a battle in the natural, but it's not. That. All right. Uh, Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggles is not against flesh and blood. You guys know this, right? As soon as we're talking about this, that, you know that scripture is coming. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. But you know what, though, you do need to know how to fight it when you're in it, right? That much I know, you know? So you may need, to, you know, not only strength from the Lord, but maybe you may need to go to your pastor or somebody that you could trust, you know, so that they could walk you through and how to fight it, right? Sometimes maybe fighting in, on your own may not be may not be something that you can stand. Again, depend on where you are with the Lord, you know, in your life. Because I feel like though, I think, I could, I could say to my mom and dad, mom and dad, did you realize, you know, I'm getting better and better maybe handling certain things, but they're not here, neither one of them to say. But I know even what I went through the last five years, you know, talk about trials, talk about, you know, the dry season. Talk about the test in your, you know, there is nothing, my dad, I lost my dad right after I came here. You know, I came here at the end of 89. I lost my dad uh, literally early 90, 91, I'm sorry, 91. You know, he didn't even get to meet any of my kids. And then that was tough. At that time, I was mad at the Lord. I'm going to tell you that. I was really mad at God. In fact, to the point, that I don't think I even showed up to church for a couple Sundays. That's how mad I was. I says, how dare you take my dad from me? You know, I left him at home, and I really did not. I f but that's because my immature Christianity. I was not mature in the Lord. Otherwise, I would not react the way I reacted. But then, you know, 2014, 
losing my mom, again, I don't want to cry it, but losing my mom was devastating to every one of us. It's devastating now, you know, when I think about it. Heart-wrenching now to think about it. I pleaded with the Lord not to take my mom. Day after day after day, you know, I went to India. As soon as I heard my mom went to the hospital, my mom was never sick. I took the time off and flew right away. And I stayed in the hospital, did not leave the hospital. I hid hospitals, but I stayed in there by my mom's side and praying over and every single minute of my day, unless I slept for hours. But that did not happen. My mom never made it home. That was tough for me to go through. But I said to the Lord, you're still the anchor of my soul. Of all these things, I still can count on your goodness and your faithfulness, Lord. You know, that's what I did. And it, those kind of things are hard to go through. And then I, a couple of years later, my brother, you know, losing mom, dad, and then losing my, my brother. He was the core of our family. Especially after my dad died, he became like a father to us. Losing him again was the most devastating thing that I had to go through again. Not just me, every one of our family members, you know. I don't know why that is. I don't understand it. I still don't understand it, you know, not having those. He was only barely 53 years old, my, my brother. You know, uh, for me, he's a giant of a man, you know, in our family. And to lose him again, it was a tough thing. But again, you know, I said to the Lord, I asked him, Lord, I want your blood to throw, flow through his blood and cleanse him from what we found and what he ended up with. But, you know, that didn't happen either. And, but I know, I know they're all in heaven. You know, they're all in heaven enjoying they're in a better place than I am. But he gets you through those kind of things. You know, when you go to him, he gets you through. And, uh, you know, you feel it and you start celebrating their lives too. And you want, to, you have this resolution after that, that you want to follow their footsteps and serve the Lord with everything you got. I am more confident of this than ever, that I want to serve the Lord all the days of my life, no matter what happens, you know. And that's the kind of resolve you end up with when you go through the trials and tribulations. But that's the God that we serve and you want to know. You will, you will build that grit, you know, as you go through from time to time, as you go through those experience after experience, you feel, you know, you build not only the trust, but also you have that grit as a Christian to go through the life's situations, okay? All right. She read Ephesians 6.12. How many knows the rest of that section's coming too if we're in spiritual warfare, right? Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be, be able to stand your ground after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of truth with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. These are our weapons of spiritual warfare. You know, they, they tell us, in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he tells us exactly what we need to do. And I liken it to the credit card. Never leave home without them. Have all those tools. Take them all with you. The belt of truth, the be breastplate of righteousness, uh, the, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. Have those things with you all the time. Don't leave home without them. And now season number six. Any guesses? The happy season. The mountaintop, thank you. Yeah. The happy season. All right. Something special happened. Maybe you had a child. Maybe you got married. Maybe you had a grandchild. Maybe you got a promotion at work. Great-grandchild. Six of them or seven of them. Yes, many arrows in that quiver. <laughs> so, I want to give you some scripture there on the happy times, right? First Chronicles 16, 8 through 12 says, Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. 
and remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. You know, and, and, and all, you know, I could read the rest of them here, but trust me, they're all the same thing. Praise God. Give him thanks. Give him praise. Proclaim his name and not in your closet. Do it, do it for, for people to hear. Let them know that you're praising God, that he has pulled through for you. He has done exactly what, you know, there, there's, there's several Psalms. We listen, 95, 103, 148, 150. They all, you know, Psalm 150, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty firmament, praise him for his mighty acts, praise him, praise him. Uh, you know, the whole Psalm is praise him, praise him, praise him here, praise him there, praise him for this, praise him for that. Everything is praise him. Praise him with clashing symbols. In other words, don't be quiet about it. Clashing symbols are loud. Be loud about your praise. You know, and, you know, we want to do praise and thanksgiving. And another thing is testimonies. Not bragging, but testimonies. This is what God has done in my life. It does two things. One, it gives praise to God like he deserves, like he, like he, you know, like we should be doing. But it also is an encouragement to others. You know, our, when we can praise God that, that he has blessed us with a job, with a job that we've been searching, when we can praise God when he's pulled our family through, or when he's blessed us with a spouse, a wonderful spouse, when he's blessed us with a house, you know, those are testimonies and encouragement to others. All right? Did you have something you wanted to add there? No, go ahead. All right, so, so you guys went through the, all those six seasons. Thank you for putting up with me. I know I cried and laughed and all that. So, you know, but, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how people live. I'm going to say this. I don't know how people live without the Lord. I don't, I don't think I can, you know. I've, I just don't know, you know. So, so if you don't know the Lord, for any chance if you're here, get to know the Lord today, Okay. Don't wait for a single second because you will feel the, you know, goodness of the Lord, you know, and you can count on it no matter what, okay? So in closing, I want to tell you something. I want to read this real quick. Rick, by Rick Warren, The Purpose Driven Life, you know, I just kind of went through that this week. Trusting God completely means having faith that he knows what is best for your life. You expect him to keep his promises. That's what we mean by when we read the scripture in Isaiah that his word will not come void, right? Empty. It will do what it says. Okay, so you expect him to keep his promises, help you with problems, and do the impossible when necessary. Right? That's why we say he's the God of impossible, right? And Micah 6, 8 says, and what does the Lord require of you to, do all, to get all that from him? What does the Lord require of you? I love, this is one of my favorite scriptures, believe it or not. It says, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and walk humbly with the Lord. That's what it is, to walk humbly with the Lord. You know, don't you think, even in, as you worship him, I just want that. I want God to know that I want to walk humbly before him, no matter what, you know. And that's what you feel, right? And that's what I want to do. You know, not that I'm perfect. I'm getting there. It's a process, right? Pastor, Pastor Justin talked about enjoy the process. I'm in the process of wanting to walk humbly before the Lord all my days. And it says, um, uh, here is another thing I was thinking. Something about that this morning came to my head. I was, I was thinking about that. A lot of times, you know, in, in, in educational circle, we talked about this deficit um, mindset versus asset-based mindset. You know, I want to move even when I'm working there. I want to move with an intention of asset-based mindset. What does that mean? Deficit mindset is you saying, I lack this, I lack that, I lack this, I need these kind of people, I need that kind of thing, you know, all, I need this resource, I need that resource. Not focusing on what you already have within you or what you already have around you, you know? I want to look at my school and say, hey, you know what? I want this, I want this, I want this. That's what I've been saying a lot of times. But now I actually thought about, you know, what is that that I have within those walls, regardless of what's outside there? And how I can tap into that, you know, in a way that would be benefit to everybody there, right? And that's, that's asset-based mindset. So here 
order for us as Christians, we could say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me, even though I don't have that, right? He that is in me is greater than that is in the world, right? And those kind of things is what we want to say. Those are our asset. He is our asset, right? And that's what, you, that's what we want to think. So I want you to think about that. If you got anything today, just get that. You know, you want to think about God being your asset, in everything that you do, right? So it's talking about Philippians 4.13. I can do all things, right? John 14.12. His word says, greater things you will do. I'll tell you, whoever believes in me will do works I have been doing, but they will do even greater, right? Isn't that what we want to do? That's called kingdom living, right? And that's what we're after. Woo! Okay, so uh, no matter where we go. And last thing. Uh, John, First John 4, 4, the one who is in you greater, obviously. No, no, therefore, the Lord your God, he is faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. And we got to do that, right? We got to be close to him and connected to him. God is always good and faithful. His goodness and faithfulness should become our focus. Did you hear that? His goodness and faithfulness should become our focus no matter what trial or what season you're going through. We are, um, so, and another important thing is glorifying him through all of that. And most importantly, here is another thing. God is in control of all our seasons, right? God is in control of our seasons. Remember Job, all his story from the beginning to the end, God was in control of all of that, Right? And, and, uh, and you can go on and on all the stories. So he is control of our lives. You know, sometimes when you, when you have that sink into your being, there is freedom. You know? And say, God, you are in control. Sometimes, yeah, I, I want to control a lot of things. In fact, my husband once in a while says that. But it's just a human mind, right? But like, so there are times that I'm recognizing there's some things that I cannot control. And I just have to lay it down and say, Lord, you know what? I'm just going to give up. I'm just going to give up. And then you do. Even though it feels a little bit still tugging on your heart, but you do feel that freedom. And I said, okay, God, you know, I just can't do it. So here it is. I'm just putting it on at your feet. And that's what you got to do. So regardless of what season you're in, just remember, God is faithful. His goodness, His goodness will bring you through no matter what. Okay? Amen? So, and if you're happy, you know, enjoy and, you know, and say amen. If you remember that song, if you're happy and you know it, say amen, right? So you want to do that, you know, no matter what season, enjoy knowing that God is with you, walking, you know, with you all the time. So he's working. Amen. All right. Let's pray. How is that sound? Okay. Stand up. All right. Stand up. Pastor Pastor Katie says stand up, so let's do that. Sorry. I know maybe we took a long time, but Lord, I just thank you for who you are in our lives, Lord God. Just let's thank him for who he is. Lord, I thank you for who you are. Lord, I thank you for bringing us through every season of our life. Lord, we know we can count on your goodness. We can count on your faithfulness, Lord God. Your faithfulness reaches to generation to generation. Lord, we thank you for that. We ask you, Lord God, to guide us, to lead us. Lord, as we go through, and Lord, help us to glorify in everything that we do. Lord God, because you deserve it, Lord. You are, deserve, you are the God, that amazing God. That you are the God of impossible. Lord, you can come through to everything that we go through. Lord, with you, I can do life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Strong.